Welcome everyone to the second session of the 2021 Arts Now Leadership Institute. Thank you all for being here. So great to see everybody. Our, um, our session today is titled uh, Introduction to Grassroots Organizing. And our objective is to discuss grassroots organizing strategy, to share some organizing tactics, and to consider the power of relationship building in organizing work. So I know there are returning Arts Now leaders, Arts Now ambassadors, arts education activism interns, and new Arts Now leaders who have really an immense amount of experience doing organizing work. And I wanna welcome you, encourage you to share your experiences um, of how organizing happens out in the field in real life, boots on the ground. So please, please speak up. Um, I'm really, really just wanting to say there are a lot of experts in the room today. So uh, we see you and we wanna hear from you. So please do not hesitate to speak up. Um, we are on, so the team from 50 plus one strategies will be our guides on this journey, this 90 minute journey uh, together today. 50 plus one strategies is a firm that specializes in civic engagement, campaign strategy, uh, management and community mobilization to make a lasting impact on the biggest issues facing our communities today. So I want to take a moment to have the team introduce themselves. I probably didn't say this, but that's me. I'm Adelaide. Um, I will um, pass it over to you, Nicole, to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. My name is Nicole Dursey. I use she, her pronouns, uh, principal and co-founder of 50 Plus One Strategies, and really looking forward to the conversation with Jessica and then Amy. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, my name is Jessica Lovejoy. I am a vice president with 50 Plus One um, and love, love, love doing these trainings and hearing from you all and learning about the great work that you're doing on the ground, especially in this space for arts advocacy. Um, I am based in DC, but have worked in California for many, many years. So um, I will send it over to Amy. Hi, my everybody. pronouns are she or hers. Hi, everybody. My name's Amy, she, her, hers, sometimes diva. Um, so excited to be here. I'm an associate with 50 plus one. And I just love what you guys are doing because I really feel like one strong voice can change the world, let alone building a coalition. So we're excited to be here and can't wait to learn all the things together with you guys. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure and excited to share our work on this uh, session with the whole gang, the whole Arts Now team, the Arts um, Ed Activism interns. All right, so before we get started, I, I do wanna take a moment to center race and equity in our conversation and to work to create an inclusive space by acknowledging the land of indigenous people um, that we all live, work, and stand on in this moment. Last week, my colleague Alexia Martin led us in an acknowledgement of Indigenous land. And in the chat, I think Amy's going to drop a link in the chat. Um, there's a document where we share the full text of that acknowledgement and, and several resources to help you identify whose land you're on. So please look for that in the chat. Um, we would now like to take a moment to pause and have everyone who is comfortable doing so, please share an acknowledgement of the land where you are in the, the chat. So we'll just pause and give everyone time to do that.
thanks so much, everyone. And you can keep keep putting those in. Wonderful to see those populating the chat. And again, you have the link to, to that resource um, that Create California put together in the chat. Now we're going to move to look over our meeting agreements that we created together last week. Um, this was a list that we populated as a group yesterday, just um, working to make sure that this, this space together at the Arts Now Leadership Institute feels as safe and comfortable as possible for everybody. I'll give you a second, Amy, to pull that up. I'm going to ask someone to come off mute and read that list for us once we get it up. Really great. Again, thank you everyone who's continuing to put um, the land acknowledgements in the chat. Here, I will um, I will go ahead and read the meeting agreements that we brought, that we put together um, last time. And if you hear that something's missing, please come off mute and speak up or put it in the chat. So we have throw glitter, not shade. Um, we have be respectful of time constraints, give space, take space, be an active listener, assume positive intent while also checking for impact, know when to step up or step back, show your kids and pets, very important, challenge the idea, not the person, show up with authenticity, be generous with praise. So really good list we created last week. Any additions? We'll be revisiting this. So if, if you come up with anything at any point, let us know um, and we will add it. All right, well, wonderful. Um, thank you all so much. I'm really excited to, to pass it over um, to Nicole, who's gonna be walking us through our, our um, agenda for our time together. Mm. Thank Thanks, you so Nicole. much, Adelaide. Um, again, just really excited to be with you all. Um, this is near and dear to my heart. I have the chance to work with a group of activists in San Francisco um, when we got more arts funding um, in San Francisco Prop E um, uh, just a couple of years ago. It was one of the best experiences of my career. Um, we did a big um, spontaneous uh, arts event in City Hall um, where uh, artists came together and uh, just played beautiful music and it's, uh, it's just been wonderful to, to be a part of this movement with you all. My husband's also a professional musician, so um, really appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, really excited for this training today. You know, we're really here to work with you all um, to make sure many of you, as Adelaide mentioned, have a lot of experience with grassroots organizing. We understand this is not brand new for many of you, um, but we do hope that this is a way to kind of step back and think about the strategy that we're trying to employ, how to utilize our personal story as a tool, um, and then really getting into tactics. Um, so that's what we're gonna do today. So I'm gonna talk through um, icebreaking and introductions um, for you all to get a chance to connect with each other, for new folks to meet each other, and those of you that have worked together to see each other again. Um, and then we're gonna do some work on organizing strategy. Um, I'll turn it over to Jessica to talk personal story. Um, and then Amy's gonna talk about tactics and then Adelaide and Abe will close us out with a current call to action, um, as well as um, some clear kind of next steps and um, questions and answers. So thanks again. Um, all right. So in terms of introductions, what we wanted to do is just randomly break you up into groups of three. Um, and in that, you have a chance to meet other arts education activists, um, folks who are doing really similar work to you um, and fighting for resources um, as you are as well. Um, in these small groups, we'd ask you to do a few things. One, share your name and where you're from, meaning what organization you're from, what location you're from, as well as something or someone that inspires you. So I'm gonna model that. I'm Nicole Dursey, uh, principal at 50 plus one strategies. I'm based in the Bay Area, but I'm originally from Slinger, Wisconsin. Um, I'm deeply inspired by young people and the movements that they lead, primarily climate change um, and young people taking on um, gun violence. So thanks everyone, you are going to do the same. So with that, um, Amy is gonna break you up into groups of three. We have about seven minutes in the group. So feel free to take a little bit of time um, to get a chance to introduce yourself, to talk about what inspires you. Um, and then we'll give you a warning and have you come back into the full group. 
Okay, great. Well, hope you all had a chance uh, to enjoy getting to know each other a little bit and meet some new folks and hear a bit about um, what has inspired you. So um, we'd love to take a chance here. You know, we know that many of you have a lot of direct experience with grassroots organizing, that you deeply understand the concept. For some of you, it may be newer. Um, you may just be kind of becoming to this piece of the work. Um, but for all of us, just to sort of make sure we step back and think about what is grassroots organizing. It's the process of building power as a group and using that power to create positive change in people's lives. So say that one more time, grassroots organizing is the process of building power as a group, using this power to create positive change in people's lives. So we'd like everyone to take a second Think about a grassroots activist or a movement that has inspired you. We're going to ask for folks to drop that in the chat box. So um, it may be something that you mentioned in the introduction conversations or something that you just want to share. I shared about um, the power of young people and the work they're doing to fight climate change and gun violence. Um, if you have some examples of movements that have really inspired you, or um, activists that have really inspired you, if you could put them in the chat. Otherwise, I will call on folks because I know that many of you <laughs> have a lot to say here and a lot of examples and um, would love to hear from some folks on this. Fred Hampton and the Rainbow Coalition. Awesome. Women's March. Love it. The artists resist in Santa Cruz. That's very cool. Yeah, Barack Obama, President coming for as a community activist, the farm workers movement, mothers out front. Oh, SAC Kids First, we worked with them. I love that group. Um, school to prison pipeline and the work that they're doing there. Yeah, these are awesome examples. Marriage equality. Yeah, for sure. We think about how much that has changed throughout our lifetime and what has been accomplished in terms of gay rights. Greta Thunberg and climate change, she keeps hanging in there. Very, very, very true. Youth of color coming together to prevent sexual harassment on BART. That's awesome. Um, Lavender Library in Sacramento. Um, this, is, this is great from a long time ago. Um, POW MIA bracelets sold during the Vietnam War with soldiers' names to remember them. The Black Lives Matter movement. Simultaneous Black Lives Matter movement. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. I think that this really kind of grounds us in what's possible. I think with all of these movements, what really made them powerful is the ability to utilize people's stories to demonstrate why this work mattered. They also brought a sense of creativity of tactics, right? Some of the things that we've talked about, farm workers having house meetings that really brought people together in their living rooms around food to be able to discuss, you know, these issues, the women's march that just was an outpouring, you know, a lot of anger and frustration, um, but also hope and, 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 and the ability to connect with each other. You know, what we've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement and the focus on both racial justice and criminal justice reform, um, but also the power of community coming together in a positive way. And I think that for so many of these movements, um, they're simultaneously clear about you know, what needs to change and what they're trying to change, but they're also really creating community. Um, and that's an incredibly important part of this work. It's not just about the issue and the cause, it's also about what can we do to actually bring people together in a meaningful way to create more collective power um, that is also based on love in a lot of instances, um, as well as anger. So thank you so much. I think one of the things that I want to say is just, you know, as we draw inspiration from these movements and others, we can take a lot from their processes. Um, we can also really say that these movements took time. <laughs> None of these movements are done, right? They're all, we're still fighting for workers' rights. We're still fighting for racial justice. We're still fighting for gender equality. We're still fighting to do something about climate change, but that we know that change can happen incrementally. Um, and there are victories that we need to be able to celebrate. Um, and we want to validate the varying timelines for change in every community. Also acknowledge the forces that make it difficult systemic racism, you know, the capitalist forces, you know, power forces that make it difficult for us to make the right decisions for our communities. Um, in terms of why we're all here today, um, we're here because we know that the arts have the power to transform lives. They bring movements of joy, creative expression. Also, the arts have a unique ability to communicate ideas and emotions of the human spirit. 
But the reality is that only 39% of California students participate in arts education. Only 39%, 61% do not. And of those, the programs can really vary. Some of those 39%, they only have one art class once a week. Some of them are participating in incredibly dynamic music programs or arts education programs. And we just know that these are programs are not allocated equitably um, and that there are way too many students in California that do not have access to arts education and we know the power that arts education can bring to a holistic perspective on life and education and the human spirit. So we've come together as a group because we want to eliminate the inequities and in access to and participation in arts education through increased public funding for the arts. That's why we're here. So we're very clear about what unites us and what our goal is. So today we're going to review grassroots tactics to help us in that goal. To start, we have to figure out what our strategy is. So in terms of strategy, strategy here is really focused on how do we build power in a way that will influence the leaders in our communities that are decision makers to consider our funding proposal. They're often education leaders, but they may also be other political leaders. So that's our strategy, right? We want to build power to influence these leaders to be able to get more arts funding across in a more equitable way in our communities. So the questions that we have to follow when we develop an advocacy strategy, and this really transcends any movement, all of the things that we mentioned here, whether we're fighting for more workers' rights, whether we're fighting to do something about climate change, or whether we are trying to get more funding for arts education, the first thing we need to say is, what is the problem? We have very clearly diagnosed what the problem is here. The second thing is, what solution are we proposing? We need the big vision solution, right, which is more equity in arts education so that all students can thrive and have access to the spirit enriching and life changing force of the arts. But we also need to know what is our more clear discernible solution at this time. So for you, that may be we want to have a 50% increase in arts funding in our school district in the next four years. Or it may be, you know, we want to um, make music and arts programs mandatory in elementary schools, you know, in our district, right? Whatever it is for you, what is that very clear solution that you're proposing? The next question is, who is the decision maker? Who gets to decide? Is it the school board? Is it on the statewide level, you know, superintendent of public instructions and, you know, elected board of education? Who gets to decide that whether or not this happens? And really being super clear about that, because our strategy must be directed towards decision makers. We can do awareness in a larger community. We can uh, do more to mobilize our base, but unless we have a strategy for the decision makers, we will not move beyond awareness to action. We've got to think about what is going to influence them. And in that, who and what most influences those de decision makers? You know, is it other local elected officials? Is it political parties? Is it labor unions? Is it neighborhood activists? Is it students themselves? Is it parent groups, you know, who really influences these decision makers? And what is the message to these decision makers? And who should deliver that message? That is how we formulate our strategy. So we're going to spend the next eight to 10 minutes or so having a discussion, um, open discussion with all of you and, you know, would love for folks to just jump in. If we have lots of folks talking, you could raise your hand um, and I can call on folks um, about how we craft a strategy for our collective cause, understanding that your communities differ. You're not facing exactly the same challenges, um, but there are certainly some very similar challenges that you all are facing as we try and get arts education allocated more equitably. So <clears throat> the discussion we want to have here is that we know what our problem is. I think we know what our big picture solution is, but community by community, who are the decision makers in your community? What do you think would influence those decision makers? What kind of key allies could you work to be able to get on board to become champions for your cause? So um, we're just gonna have a few folks 
chiming in. Um, appreciate uh, people in the chat, but would love for folks to be able to um, express their thoughts verbally. Um, so if people could, who'd be willing to just chime in and share what this means in your community. I can call in folks too, because <laughs> I'm sure all of you have some ideas. Allison, I see you're clapping. Maybe you're willing to well, share. Or hand up. I don't know. Oh, good. Time. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so uh, we have in Sacramento, we have 13 different school districts. So there's 13 different bodies we have to work with. So part of it is also working with the, the arts leads or the VAPA uh, directors of the districts so that we can find out what it is that they're doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. So we can be very specific with the school board members. Um, and also doing background research on the school board members to find out what are their hot buttons. Do they have kids in schools that have arts or not? So making it a little bit more personal advocacy to those individual board members. That's awesome. I mean, that's really, you know, doing a power analysis of these board members and being able to see what is going to move them. Um, I think that's awesome. That's great strategy. Um, let's go to Esha. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, it's pronounced Isha. Isha uh, I think I think that um, in my community, there are lots of people who are very passionate about arts. I know a sophomore who directed an entire play. Um, you know, she coordinated funds. She um, set up like um, a partnership with like a theater company for us to be able to perform. Um, and so I think um, having these passionate students as well as community members be our allies and help us like push the school board to um, support arts education um, would be, you know, wonderful. I think we have really powerful allies in my community and I think someone needs to bring them together. Yeah, that's awesome, Mesha. And I think it's, you know, people really respond to having a concrete action that they can take and being really clear about what it's going to take to move them. And it's like, you know, you have young people and other activists that are stepping up and saying, we need this, but if we can, as leaders help figure out, you know, what do we want them to accomplish? And do we have a specific ask, you know, of the school board or of other leaders that we can move folks um, to action and mobilize them um, is really fantastic. So thank you for that. That's really, I love the story of the sophomore that, that did the play. That's amazing. Thanks, Asha. Um, Nadia, am I pronouncing that right? Nadia, yeah. Nadia, thanks. Um, so I actually live in the same district as Isha, so we share a very similar like community, um, like expectations and stuff like that. And I think like our school board is the main like the decision makers, but they, I think there's more power in numbers in the amount of people like to get them to listen. Um, I think they don't really care about anything unless it the community makes it a big community wide issue. And like Isha mentioned, like we do have a lot of individuals who feel passionately about like arts and arts education. The thing is that we also have a lot of parents who value STEM and things like that mm. a lot more. So it's a little, it's difficult to get everyone on the same page about like community values. Um, mm. So I think like, if more parents were aware of like the importance of arts education and, and were more aware that it is important to students, then um, that would also help. And I think also like it was mentioned earlier, like doing some research on board members and knowing specific things is a big thing in our district as well, because like they don't um, like they don't listen that much. Mm. <laughs> so knowing what will get them to listen is super important. So yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Nadia. Great, great stuff. Uh, let's go to Matthew and then Connie. Uh, hello. Uh, I just wanted to share some allies that I think would be very important, especially in my community. Um, I know in my city, um, community is something that is very valued. Um, I live in Pomona and in downtown Pomona, it, they call it, it's like the arts alley. Um, and that's where a lot of artists come to like congregate to sell their arts or to like perform. And I think just being able to form allies with not only them, but the small businesses around them can help um, persuade not only like the school board, but maybe also the, the city council 
which is something that's very important in my city, um, especially since um, a lot of people come out from out of our city just to come see the arts that we yeah. call Saturday, which is like the art walk. Um, and it's a huge thing that's bringing like money into our own city. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's insane to me that like schools in our own city don't really fund the arts, which is insane. So I think building those partnerships with um, small um, businesses and schools and artists is something that can help us like join together to really make that's change. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's having a strategy even outside of the school, you know, because the arts don't stop at the, you know, student walls and being able to think about how can you build those connections um, and the economic lens, I think, is a really great one, too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's hear from Connie. Hi, um, I have. Uh, uh, can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'll piggyback on to what Matthew said. Uh, recent, we have an organization called Creative Bridges that has 20 nonprofits, uh, all the museums and community centers, et, uh, et cetera. But we just added uh, three new members organizations. One is the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which I think is really critical. Uh, the other is the Sonoma Valley Vintners and Growers who oh, are supporting yeah. arts education as well as now we're working with the city manager to talk about a cultural plan. Uh, when, you, when you talk about e economy and um, creative economies, I think that's something we want our students to go into. So really including them in the, in the whole package is important. Love it, that's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of thinking about who are those unlikely allies sometimes, but really folks who can understand the importance of the arts and share that vision. And, you know, it's pretty hard when you've got in a place like Sonoma, the Chamber of Commerce and the wine, you know, folks and the community-based folks and students and arts advocates like together, it's hard to say no when you've got that powerful coalition. So really great. Um, awesome. Well, I wish we had more time to talk forever about strategy, but I think this was really great. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my fabulous colleague, um, Vice President Jessica Lovejoy. Thank you so much to Esha and Nadia and Matthew and uh, Connie and I think it was Caroline. Um, really appreciated all your feedback. Um, and Jessica's going to talk about personal story and the power of that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, well, I'm so grateful to be a part of this training. I um, have spent, you know, many, many um, campaigns working on both advocacy programs and um, and developing personal story is those hand in hand with that strategy piece that Nicole just spoke about. I think that once we've identified some key players in, in the campaign and what your objective is going to be, now we need to figure out how we're going to communicate with them and how we're gonna engage with them on our issues. Those authentic and meaningful communications have the potential to break through and to reach the key people that you're trying to activate within the campaign. You know, we research shows um, study after study that people really respond to emotion. They also respond to, you know, connection and building that connection to the cause that we're all working on is critical <clears throat> for decision makers and also for recruiting others to join you in this effort. And one way to do that is really through storytelling. Storytelling is an impactful way to share information about our movement. Um, people will connect with those stories on a deeper, more personal level, level than just facts and statistics. How many of you have seen um, those videos or um, the analysis of like, you know, you will send people facts all the time and they don't retain it, but you tell someone a story and they could tell you every word and every aspect and detail of that person's life. You know, it is through uh, relation that we, in building those relationships that we're able to motivate people um, so effectively. Stories are particularly important when we're trying to create cultural change. Every major movement that we have talked about or the ones that inspired you earlier in this training, you know, those are tied to personal stories. There is someone um, that you can think of that was involved that shared the personal story that helped motivate others. And when we hear stories in movies or in television or in books and from friends, those 
moments have a great deal of influence on how we view ourselves and on others. And I, I want to just hone in on this because the question here is how do we use this for social justice? And it's important. And what we're going to do today together is think about how we're connecting our personal stories to the broader problem that we're trying to solve for and the movement we're trying to build. So you don't want people to write your story off for chance. You know, you want people uh, to understand that you are here for a reason and that you are a messenger within this, that you were called to do this work. Um, your stories can be very meaningful. They can be about you or they can be about somebody else um, that you've interacted with, but they are really the reason behind the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we involved? And why do we care so deeply about this issue? We also um, want to make sure that people that you're talking with in this messaging, you know, and talking, whether you're recruiting others to join or you're expressing your motivation to, uh, in, to influencers and to decision makers, you know, we want people to understand the problem that we're talking about and to view it through your lens. And the story, the structure that we're going to go over next is going to help us do that. So well, I think we'll go to the next slide, Amy. Perfect. There are three components to the structure, and it is called the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. You'll see many um, books and speeches are structured in this way, and that's for good reason. We want to start with you, why you were there, why did you choose to get involved, and how has that choice changed you? The story of us is the next section um, or theme that you'll go to which is really focused on what is our collective goal? How does your story of self integrate to the people that are in this Zoom room or at the school board meeting with you or a part of the arts community where you're at? The story of us is centered in, you know, why are we all here today? The point, an important point here also is that we need to think about equity. You know, we all come from different experiences and perspectives, and even if we're a part of the same community, we may have a wildly different um, experience in that. And so understanding and cultivating the story of us is a great way to level set and to illuminate critical intersections um, in our privilege and in our experience. So the story of us should be a really um, inclusive story. That you're building. And then the story of now is what we consider the ask. This is the urgent challenge that you are sharing that it's going to inspire others to take action with you. I don't want this to be daunting. You know, I want, um, this is a, a tool that we use to be able to break down into structure uh, your personal pitch, whether it be to a volunteer or to the decision makers. But this is the basis of the message of why you are doing this, why we're meeting this moment, why it's important, and then what are we asking of people to do? So I will model this for you, and we're going to break out then for about 10 minutes for you just to do some individual reflection to, to try this out on your own. So um, we'll go with my story. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Jessica Lovejoy, and I am a kid who grew up in public schools, really around the country. Um, I was an adolescent who was thrust into the foster care system, um, and I always found a home and a safe space in the arts and in the creative community, whether that was in my arts class with arts teachers or at my local community center, um, going to concerts um, and doing musical creativity um, and learning about music or um, just learning how to draw and finding a meditative space in that. You know, it was really important to me to find that space to express myself. And as a confused and often frustrated child, you know, it was a place for me to identify and to develop my self identity. We're all here today because we know that the potential of kids and the that arts education can help individuals see and grow their potential there. No matter their circumstances, the arts are a place that's to level set for everyone. 
Uh, it is a place to, to hone in on your self-identity. It is a place to find yourself. And it's an inc incredibly important outlet uh, for children of all ages. And now our co collective call to action is to stand up for the arts. We need your help to build power. We need you to help us in joining by joining the conversation. We need you to advocate for arts, to influence our leaders and to secure funding. Um, and that's what we're doing today. We're all here to learn about how to do that. And uh, now we're gonna learn about those tactics next. So that is my, you know, back of the napkin self us now. Um, it is all true. It is, you know, authentic to who I am. Uh, and it connects both my personal experience with how I view, you know, the arts and how it's important in our culture and our community, and then also what we're trying to do to motivate people. Um, so with that, uh, I want to just take some time to craft personal story. Um, and we're gonna, I think we're, as far as time goes, why don't we just do it for about seven minutes and then we'll come back and have a little bit more time to share. So this is just individual reflection. Feel free to turn your cameras off. I'm gonna put seven minutes on the clock um, and we'll in the chat drop like a two minute warning.
All right, folks, it is about that time to wrap up our reflection. So if you could to come back to join us, we'll do a debrief with the group. We'll see if folks are coming back on. This is great. Okay. We have mostly everyone back. So I'd love to hear a little bit um, from you all about how that was for you. Um, if anyone would like to demonstrate their story of self, um, us and now, oops, there. Um, and, or just anything that felt, you know, good about drafting that out, spending some time reflecting there, anything that was challenging to you, feel free to come off mic. We'd love to just have a little debrief as a group. All right, I'll be brave. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> um, so, um, so um, I grew up in a time when schools still had arts as a regular part of their curriculum. And I will never forget Mrs. Boyd, my fourth grade choir teacher. And I still remember the lyrics from songs that we learned in fourth grade. And we did a musical in fifth grade of Winnie the Pooh. And I have great memories of that. And that experience of being in choir and drama took me all the way through high school. And it was my tribe. It was my group um, that I felt safe with. And the choir room was a safe place to be. And um, I see now kids don't have that experience anymore. And it's just about filling in bubbles. And so, um, so I really think it's important for you know, my kids and my grandkids and, and all of our kids in the community to be, to have that same experience of the beauty and the belonging of arts in all the different expressions and to make it a fundable priority because we know that academically and socially, emotionally, children need the arts. It's not just about filling in the bubbles. And especially now as we have kids coming back into school, the mental health of children is at a critical stage and the arts is the answer to that sense of belonging and that sense of community um, and that sense of bonding that the arts provides like no other topic. That is awesome. Can we give a round of applause for Allison? You know, one of the other things that I've done before in some of my speeches um, is I actually ask the audience or the group for their aha moment. And I give a little bit of a pause for them to think about what was a moment in time that arts really impacted them, because mm -hmm. these are adults, and um, to give them a moment to think about that. And I had a, a gentleman, an attorney come up to me afterwards with tears in his eyes and he said, I still remember playing the drums for Little Drummer Boy. And so, so sometimes it's also inviting the people in to build their own self story, even if it's just internally. Yeah, yeah. I really um, liked what you said. I, I really was following um, your structure there. And I really liked what you said about how it used to be, you know, and this is an expectation. And then the the story of us was what caught me is when you said that this is a moment where we need that beauty and that belonging, like those words stuck out for me. I think you did that really well. Um, and then tying it to the mental health of kids and community um, was really, really brilliant. So thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. I think we've got time for like one or two more. I just wanted to illuminate something and it's really just a reframe and I think it was happening in the chat but using the word tribe is not necessarily the best um, just as Ken had said just so we can really honor the 
purpose and origin of the word, but we are all here to learn, um, you know, and change and, and move together. So we just wanted to highlight that for all of you. Thanks, Lexia. Okay. Well, if uh, anyone else is interested in sharing, um, you know, the Create California team is always here um, to help you practice your personal stories. In some of the takeaways from today's training, you're going to receive um, some prompts and uh, information on how to structure this and, and exercise. And we encourage you to do that. Um, just keep the structure in mind as you're forming a message. And throughout this whole uh, program, we're going to be talking about message and message development, and uh, this is a really good starting block, a foundational piece there. So with that, um, I think we can, uh, we're going to take a quick um, screen break. I think we should do here just about five minutes, um, and uh, we'll- Two minutes, um, folks said is good, so- Oh, two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes is good. Okay. We'll come back in just about two minutes. We'll do um, a quick screen break, get up and do a stretch, um, go take a bio break, grab a glass of water. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and we'll see you just in a few. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Amy, my colleague, um, who's going to talk us through our next section um, and really get into the nitty gritty on how we're turning both the strategy and the story of why we're here into action today. Yeah, so thank you so much, everybody, for thinking about your personal story. I know that for me, that's always, I get so hung up. It's, it's hard to be vulnerable like that. So pre definitely appreciate um, Allison, you for sharing. Um, so as far as organizing tactics, um, now that we kind of talked about our, our personal or we've thought about our personal stories, we can begin to think about the tactics of how we'll engage in meeting our advocacy goals. So tactics are simply just the ways that we're gonna use to influ influence the different education leaders and decision makers um, about what we want. Um, and so each tactic, um, you really want the tactic to fit into the overall strategy. So, you know, a lot of times we want to just want to start get moving and do things, but like, just make sure like that your tactic, whatever you're choosing really makes sense for the, the, the goal that you, the overall goal that you're trying to meet. Um, so that's that. And then, so thinking about um, your, thinking about your personal stories, I would love, and you can answer this in the chat box or just feel free to unmute yourself and talk. Um, those stories or the concepts that you're conveying in those stories, how do you guys, what do you guys think is the best way to deliver or use those stories um, to, to influence the decision makers? Um, and I can give you, um, I can give you an example. Um, my personal story, not necessarily to the arts, was I did a lot of work getting undocumented, helping to get undocumented immigrants in California. Um, access to our state healthcare system, which they're locked out of. And uh, in trying to do that, we were listening to all these stories of, 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 of young people that were, they were the first ones to, to get healthcare. And, and their stories were just, we don't need it. We don't need it. Our grandparents need it. Our grandparents need it. Um, you know, my mom is, you know, has this going on and my dad has this going on or my grandma. Um, and so hearing those stories just broke my heart because here you are trying to help this group of people, but they don't even, they are, they just want to help their parents. So when it came time to get their parents on board, I talked about how it was really hard for me to hear those stories and not to be able to help more people. Um, and that, you know, the, the love that these, there, these, 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 kids had for their older family members and their elders in their community. Um, so maybe that wasn't necessarily my personal story, but it was how their stories made me feel and made me act and, and, and share and realize that um, these adults needed, these seniors needed to be prioritized. So those are, and, and, and when it was time to prioritize them, those were good stories to tell the decision makers and definitely influence them. So that's kind of a way that you could start to think about 
um, how you're going to use your stories. But um, does anybody else have any ideas on ways that you think you might use your story? Editorial, Connie is, Connie is thinking ahead. Editorial series in the newspapers, large scale art installations in public spaces. These are great. These are great ways to use your story. So we're going to actually go into that. Um, so I love, like I said, Connie, that you brought up um, working with the media. Working with the media in, is awesome. And you can start off with baby steps or you can start off with, you can start off with, you know, like Connie with an editorial. Um, there are two ways that people generally kind of start working with the media and that's through letters to the editor or that's through writing um, an op-ed. So a letter to the editor, how, oops, sorry, how you would do that would be you just, you know, you're, you're reading the newspaper, you're reading their articles online, you know, something grabs you and it's an article grabs you and you, you realize that the article has a connection to your store, to what you're advocating for. Um, so if it was an article about something creative a teacher did, um, you could write a letter to the editor. They're generally pretty short. They give you each, each um, newspaper kind of has different um, wording guidelines, but they give you about 150, maybe 300 words to say. Um, so you would say writing in about this, you know, teacher was awesome and it inspired me, but it makes me realize that um, our society needs more arts and this is another way. So you tie in your point um, and you submit it. And so those actually are not too hard. They're a good baby step. And a lot of times they do get picked up and bonus point mention um, the decision maker, mention the decision maker, like it, it, if it makes sense, um, because if that decision maker appears in that op-ed or excuse me, in that letter to the editor, if most of them have a Google alert for the being in the media, if not other ways. Um, so they'll, they might see it, you know, and that's a great way. And, and your community will see it and it'll become, um, it, you know, you create awareness in the community as well. So an op-ed is just a longer form, um, not necessarily replying to anything, but maybe telling your story and, um, you know, telling the reasoning behind um, your, you know, what, why you want what you want. Um, and so what's awesome is Create California has, has tools um, that you can use um, to help you. They have, they have, a op, they have an op-ed template um, that'll show you, but it'll give you a guide, but again, um, be, uh, be, be, yeah, it, it's your words, it's your voice. And it's just important to get different voices out there. Um, I, we, probably about two years of statistics came out that in written, um, written word, 75% of published or written word, it comes from the white male perspective. So, you know, we all just need to work really hard to, not that, you know, we all just need to get work really hard to get our voices out there. Um, because when you are published, you're kind of writing the history and setting the tone. So hope you guys consider that it's, 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 a great thing if you can do it. I've only been published once, but it was, I was so proud. So just know it's, you know, it takes a little while to get used to. Um, okay. And then also take creative action using art. And that was something that Caitlin brought, brought up. Um, this is, we worked as um, uh, our team at 50 plus one strategies worked on a yes on prop 16 um, campaign, which was a ballot measure um, last year. And we had a ton of students they were so passionate about this proposition to bring, bring better equity um, to education amongst many things. And they have this art fair. So folks came and they painted what a passing yes on Prop 16 would mean to them. Um, it was just really fun. And you see, you know, uh, people just really got into it. And it's just another way to, to express yourself. Um, so, you know, you can have a round table panel with students and parents. You can do that. Um, when it makes sense in person or on Zoom, um, if there's school programming, um, if there's a school carnival, um, you know, you can have a, you can have a debt, you can have a table out there and flyer. Um, you can, so integrating actions with like existing school programming is a great idea. And then we'll go into um, meeting with decision makers uh, 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 in, an, in the next course, but also that is something else. So if you guys have any other ideas of things that you 
um, could do, drop them in the chat box that you've seen be successful. Okay, and then next up, I think this is really important, um, defining success. What we're trying to do here, if we wouldn't be together and we wouldn't be having a whole training series if it was easy. Um, so, you know, what we're doing here is it, it has the capacity to change so many people's lives and just, you know, open up opportunity to so many people, but it's gonna take time. And so you just have to, you know, sometimes when things take a little too long, um, like our undocumented healthcare series, we had to keep including people and, it, and we haven't even included everybody yet, but it's taken a couple of years. Um, and instead of being sad that it can't be um, everybody, I look at it as like, yes, okay, we opened the door with this group of people and we're gonna, I know we're gonna work hard to add these next group of people. You really just have to celebrate um, the, the small successes. So that starts with defining the success. Um, effective advocacy takes time. Tax, tactics and tools um, are to reach our long-term goals. Um, and to, success looks like building relationships with key decision makers and with other advocates. So I personally, um, did you do you did you connect like like our awesome um, two participants earlier today that are in the same city? Did you connect? Did you find an ally? Are you guys going to work together? That's success. Um, you know, were you able to get the social media up and program up and running and create beautiful graphics and they finally got posted? That's a success. So focus on um, you know the focus on the things you're doing every day to. Um, make to you know to make it to to keep keep everybody um happy and and going and just understanding that you're building a foundation to you know a, a, a bigger goal and the goal is worth the time that it's going to take um yeah so with that i'm going to go to the next slide and abe and adelaide you're going to take it over from here yeah thank you amy Thank you so much. Um, I want to introduce everyone to Abe Flores. He is our new policy director at Create California. Um, you will have the opportunity to, he will be on all of these Leadership Institute sessions with us. Um, and I hope you'll have the opportunity to intersect with him. Um, but I'm just so excited to pass things over to Abe because he is going to share a real time in the moment um, advocacy call to action that has just come up this week come to our attention um, and he is going to to give you all the details so over to you abe hi everyone pleasure to be here and look forward to working with all of you and learning from all of you and finding out how, how i can be helpful to all the work that you guys are doing so first um really want to keep this short but the California Department of Public Health came out with some guidelines that used a, uh, a negative frame for the arts. It was labeling the arts as extracurricular. So we, this was brought to our attention really quickly that morning, and we decided to um, follow up with the, 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 uh, the Dr. Aragon, who was the head of public health, and basically let him know to change that language. Uh, that we wanted to make sure that arts are always framed as core. Uh, we reminded him that they are mandated by Ed Code, the connection to the uh, California's economy, and why the fra this negative frame is part of the reason why there's inequitable access to, to the arts. We decided to do a two-track approach. We sent a letter directly to uh, Dr. Aragon, as well as posted uh, it to Twitter. Um, the ask was pretty simple. Uh, it was, please don't reinforce this negative frame. Use this term, performing arts and sports. It's more inclusive, doesn't reinforce that frame. Uh, we immediately got a, a email from the, from the director. We have a meeting with him on Monday. Uh, and as well as pushed it out on Twitter and have all, all of our followers uh, retweet that. So the tone for us was solutions orient oriented. The ask was pretty clear. Uh, we tried to be as informative as possible. So we have this meeting scheduled for Monday um, with him and his team. We aren't launching a full Twitter storm just yet. Um, but if next week we don't get the solution we want, 
want, then we will definitely follow up with all of you. Uh, but just wanted to get that out. Um, the frame didn't work for us. It, it's part of the, the, the problem. Um, we decided to address it directly with um, the director via email, as well as this meeting, uh, as and showed our our public, um, our public uh, Twitter folks uh, to make sure that that we're pushing this this uh, message out. And next week, we if we don't get that change, we will all be asking all of you to please reshare and to uh, get get the message out as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abe. Yes, and so wait and hear from you'll you'll hear from me on Monday if there is a so we'll wait for the meeting on Monday um, after we sort of hear what Dr. Aragon is is proposing to address this issue. Um, if we feel like there is a next step, um, I will definitely reach out. I think either way, there's going to be a next step um, because you know if the change is made, we're going to want to make sure that um, he understands that we're grateful for for him hearing us so there will be um, a tweet template that's sort of saying thank you or in the other scenario um, a different approach so you'll hear from me on monday or early tuesday about that thank you abe really appreciate um, that so this just sort of came up this week this morning we felt like we wanted to to share this with you as an example of um of how to identify the problem, the decision maker, what your message is, and then how to get that message out. So it was timely. Great. Well, let's take um, a moment and just so Amy, you can um, advance the next slide, just keeping this up. This is our um, our next session next week, Thursday, same time, same place. Um, would love to have you at the digital strategy and public will building session next week. Um, 50 plus one team will again be leading that session with special guest um, Cognito. Cognito is the, the communications firm that creates all of our graphics, redid our website recently. Um, so they're really experts on, on digital strategy and public will building. So it'll be great to have that team joining us as well. Um, and we have some time. So I'd love to open it up for questions or um, if folks wanted any kind of clarification. If not, we, we're ending early, but let's open it up, see if there's anything um, to talk about in these last 10 minutes. Um, somebody in the chat had brought up a um, question about um, creating urgency. Did we answer that in the chat? I think we could answer that. Yeah, do you have thoughts on that, Amy? I'm happy to chime in too. So, thought, so it was um, thoughts about creating urgency. Debbie was, was that was that right? You just want to create urgency around the ask? Yes. Um, in in respect of building the grassroots advocacy, you know that we all have to do. Also, it feels like uh, time after time, year after year, we remain in a state of, that we are. And how do we how do we push it to still be solution partners, but provide urgency with our messaging? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, there's a few things. One is sometimes there's very clear deadlines and decision points, right? Like around budgets and the budget process. Um, you know, there's clear opportunities for people to weigh in. And I do think it's like making the most of those moments. You know, most public budgets have like a public comment period, um, as well as when the decision makers are paying attention. So, you know, both direct contact to them, be it you know, emails, in-person meeting, phone calls, tweet storms, you know, letters to the editor, and then also just mobilizing and, and, and being able to get awareness amongst the base around those particular moments that already exist. But then in addition to that, you know, I have seen folks create urgency, even when it's not necessarily in that time frame. You know, some examples have been like, we're going to have just an arts advocacy week, you know, where we know decision makers, you know, maybe it's not at the forefront of exactly what they're deciding that week, but, you know, you can give people 
um, something to rally around that is an opportunity for them to come together. So create that Swords of Arts Advocacy Week. Um, have also seen creative public events as a way to, and obviously, you know, we're in COVID time and people are doing stuff virtually still, but to the extent that you can do, you know, outdoor safe events that draw media attention. Um, I've also seen that be effective in terms of this is an urgent moment because we're doing this event around it. Um, curious, you know, you can even say by the end of this month, we need to have, you know, 300 um, emails into the Board of Education to show our strength, even if it's not a decision at the end of the month, people kind of think about that. So those are a few ideas. I don't know, Amy or Jessica or others, if you have anything to, to add. Well, you had mentioned, um, a, a Debbie, in, in regards to mobilization, um, and it is hard getting, it's hard getting volunteers, even if people really, really, really care, our time is spread so thin, um, you know, and the people that do really care, sometimes they're doing other advocacy things. So I always say, just be really smart with your time and the things that you're going to do. People get burned out, but if they know that it's something that isn't going to be that hard of a lift, um, they're more likely to just kind of do it and get it done. And then maybe they get a little attached to you. It was really fun to do, or they care about it. And I would just say, you know, respect people's time, start them off easy and just know that like, um, just the action should be, should be a, a effective and not not too many just digestible for people to be able to do so I would just say that that helps with mobilization when you're not quite asking for too much and you're kind of let setting the expectations of, of what folks are going to do ahead of time thank you yeah. Amy and Nicole oh, oh. sorry I, I just was, go ahead oh, no no go ahead sorry oh I was just I saw Can had her hand up I just wanted to make sure but if you were going to jump in on this go ahead Sure, I'll just add on real quickly. I think um, this is a really common issue in issue organizing because the work is long term, right? It's not always centered around an election date and uh, or as a you know a deadline. And so uh, there can be moments where it feels like kind of stagnant or you're not sure what um, you're organizing around or a sense of urgency. And that's okay because at the root of this, like movement building is about relationships. And so, just continuing to recruit people that are, have these shared interests that want to do take action for the sake of continuing to build community is a is a tactic that I would focus on when you're not um, fully you know driving towards a deadline or a public speaking period or something like that right those small moments of just community building and spending time together to do something um, even if it doesn't you know make change right now are still really important. Thanks, Jessica. Can did you want to come come off mute and share, or was that? Yeah, I was just I was just thinking about like this article that I read probably like four years ago about like seventy billion dollars um, circulating in the economy. You know, focused on on trading art or arts in 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 general, and um, you know, like right now it's obviously not that much, but when our economy was okay, um, seventy billion I think it was that was like circulating so when the health department you know somebody that has such a um, you know everybody's looking at that right now to say something like that where it's an extracurricular I think like a, the movement of incorporating arts into like the core uh, every subject and letting surfacing that it's a core subject um, is so important right now I just wanted to say that Thank you. Yeah, hitting hitting that message of um, the arts contribution to the the creative economy, the economy overall, is so important and has um, often a high impact with folks who perhaps um, don't immediately think of themselves as art art people um, who immediately understand the the value of the arts sort of pushing the the argument about the economy forward is important in those moments thanks can um i see something from emily in the chat emily's bringing up um decision making timelines um like i think the lcap uh timelines throughout the year are a great example um and a, a really effective way to to create urgency thanks for that um, Anybody else? Uh, I see, I think Connie has her hand up. Great, go ahead. 
Yes, um, I think that uh, I've, I've read in a number of cases um, that, for instance, Heather Cox Richardson's an important historian who talks about the changing um, culture and political environment. And I remember uh, reading that it takes 3% of the population getting out and, and supporting something to actually affect change. That's a pretty small amount so, and pretty stunning. And so I think that, you know, if you take that locally, it doesn't take that many people to affect change. Thanks, Connie. Good reframe on, on that. Um, the idea that we have to have a huge swell of, of folks to, to bring change about. Uh, Ariana, over to you. Yeah, I guess my question is on, like given that we're in our like separate communities and every community is unique, like how much room is there for collaboration across the different counties or school districts? Like Matthew's in Pomona and I'm here in Ontario. So hearing someone that's nearby doing some great work, like how can we utilize like our neighboring um, communities as well? Fifty plus one team, you want to take that? I can speak to that from sort of a programmatic side, like how we can facilitate the collaboration. But I'd be interested to hear how you think about it from an organizing perspective. Yeah, I think yeah. the first. Go ahead, Jess. Please. Oh, um, I think that you know, objectively, like if your targets are county-based, that's one thing. But tactically, like there's a creative process there that you can. Um, share right and actually building community like in many of the organizing programs that we worked on um building that community to see that there are other people organizing in other places has been really powerful um and just having a space to collaborate and bounce ideas off of what's working in your county what's working here what are the things that we're trying to activate around um creating just a an ecosystem of brainstorming and um, a feedback loop, I think also can be really helpful. Yeah, I totally agree. I also think it's, um, you know, sharing those successes can be very motivating. Like I have definitely seen, I do a lot of similar work with um, advocates that are fighting for, for children and youth funding, which obviously there's overlap, but where they say, you know what, this is what we did and we won in Richmond. And that's why this is relevant to Long Beach or San Joaquin. And um, it could really help be able to share those success stories to show what's possible and, and make a difference with decision makers. Ariana, I also think there's this way to create some friendly competition as well between school districts. Like if there's a, 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 a nearby school district that has um, a success that you can hold up to your district, um, that can be really effective, especially if it's within the same county as well. And then I, I mentioned programmatically, like how, how we're facilitating your collaboration. Um, we have, you know, monthly meetups, and that's really the space for communities, the leaders of communities around the state to connect and collaborate and share um, challenges um strategies brainstorm um all of the the leaders and ambassadors just this morning um would have re received from alexia an email that lays out the schedule of all of those events so really hope to to see everyone coming together for those arts now meetups i am seeing we're at time am i missing i just want to say thank you thank you so much to the the 50 plus one strategies team this was wonderful really looking forward um, to our next two sessions with 50 plus one. I hope to see you all next week, Thursday, 3.30. And thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.